Good morning, Hope Church. I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful Christmas, and I hope that you are all, all us Buckeye fans are slowly but surely recovering in the wake of yesterday's tragic game. Uh, I tell myself it's just a game, um, but when the Buckeyes lose, it just it hurts a little. I understand, so we'll try to um, work through those feelings today um, so that we can enjoy the rest of our um, time off um, before our Christmas vacation and that season is over, for those of us lucky enough to have it. Um, I have a few announcements for you that I want to make sure that I cover. Um, first of all, next week, the 5th, Right after the second service at 12.30, we're going to eat some lunch, and then we're going to undecorate our church. So this is our hope on the go, or maybe we should call it, um, as we do sometimes, hope on this day. We'll be right here, and um, any help we can get is always welcome. Uh, many hands make light work, and this is a job that does need to be done. And um, luckily, um, we are blessed with a lot of good helpers. So hopefully you'll turn out for that. Uh, I also want to mention uh, our Bible studies that are coming up. We have two um, classes of the Epic of Eden, Understanding the Old Testament. Um, the first one will be, well, I guess there's no particular order, uh, will be held at 6.30 on Monday, starting the 13th of January, um, and that will be here at the church um, in the youth room. If you are interested in that, please let me know. Um, because of the holidays and everything else, we just haven't gotten a sign-up sheet um, ready yet, but I will need to order some books um, for that. So um, just let me know. I'll order a bunch of books, and um, hopefully we'll have enough. If not, I'll, I'll get a few more. Um, but we're also having that same class being held um, at Patty Carpenter's house um, starting at the same time uh, on the same day, on the 13th at 6.30. Um, if you're interested, talk to Patty, talk to me. Um, we do have some um, room constraints, um, since it's in her home instead of um, here where we have a little more um, set up for conference and teaching and that kind of stuff. So um, do let us know about that. Um, the other study we're going to be doing starting on Wednesday the 15th will be a study on uh, 1 Corinthians. It will be just a kind of a chapter by chapter study. Um, and that will be at 3 o'clock on Wednesdays and 6.30 as well. So that's all the announcements I have for you today. Um, let's get our hearts ready for worship as uh, we listen to Beth with our prelude. <clears throat> Thank you. 
If you're able, would you stand and join me in the call to worship? Come, let us worship together and share our witness of God's living presence in the world. It is time to become focused, not on our wants or complaints, but on God. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the good news of God, saying, the time has come. The realm of God is at hand. And move and have our being. Jesus said, repent and believe the good news. The time has come. In the silent places of my soul, I turn to God, for God alone is our rock and salvation. And we sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Please join me in prayer. Shine in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Shine in our lives. Shine in the word now read and proclaimed. And we, children of your light, shining for all people, will follow. Amen. be seated as we listen to God's word. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. 
I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the, in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to scoop, stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their, brother, their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Guess who's preaching today? <laughs> wow. That's a lot of stuff. 20 verses that Alex just read. And, you know, Mark is kind of known as this guy who gets to the point. He um, doesn't mess around. He tells the story and um, keeps on moving. Um, and in this 20 verses, he covers a lot of ground. He tells us about the ministry of John the Baptist, Tells us about the camel hair clothes, the wild honey, and the locust. We have Jesus baptized. Jesus announces the good news, and he calls his first disciples. And that's just some of what happens all in just 20 verses. You know, if you look at the other Gospels, at this point, Matthew's just barely gotten through Jesus' genealogy, let alone actually starting to tell the story. Luke has Gabriel still talking to Zechariah, trying to convince him that um, Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And John, well, John's always doing something a little different than everybody else, isn't he? So we have all this amazing stuff to talk about in the first 20 verses of chapter 1 of Mark. And with all this great stuff to preach about, and with the joy and spirit of Christmas still fresh in the air, what did I choose to talk to you about today? That's right, folks. Repentance. The R word. And I decided to name my message the R word for two reasons. First, no one really likes to talk about repentance too much. But more importantly, it sounds a lot better 
than my first choice, which was disconnected and incoherent ramblings on the topic of repentance. <laughs> and I know what you're all saying right now. We should have known better than to come today after the last time this guy preached. <laughs> but if you notice, we didn't promote it a whole lot this time prior to uh, me being here. Um, attendance is low enough um, on the Sunday after Christmas anyway. So repent. What do you think about when you hear that word? Take a second and just what comes to your mind? Do you see an angry and wrathful God hurling lightning bolts toward all the sinners, maybe sending a plague or a flood or two to us all? Maybe you see a TV evangelist with slick back hair. Repent all you heathens or face the fiery furnace of eternal damnation. Reach into your hearts, reach into your souls, reach into your wallets and you too can be saved. And I'm sorry, I just don't do slick back hair very well anymore. <laughs> well, I don't think Jesus has any of these things in mind when he tells us to repent. But it is important to understand and to realize that Jesus does call us to repent. You know, sometimes it can be easy to forget this. Um, and on all sides of the theological spectrum, whether you're a uh, theological, liberal, conservative, or anywhere in between, I think we tend to like to cherry pick a little bit from our scripture. And we kind of like to explain away the things we don't like or maybe understand, or we just ignore them. It's not so easy to do this with the question of repentance. We just can't ignore this call to repent. We can't say, oh, well, that's from the Old Testament and doesn't apply to the gospel because I'm pretty sure that Mark might actually be one of the gospels. We can't say, but those aren't really Jesus' words, so we can take them with a grain of salt because in my Bible, they're red. In fact, the very first words of the Son of God that Mark records are these words in chapter 1, verse 15. The time has come. The kingdom has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And just in case you thought you were going to get out of this by looking at some other translations, sorry. I looked at a total of 12, and only one did not use the word repent. And for the sake of full disclosure... Young's literal translation says, reform your life instead of repent. I'm not sure that's any better or easier for us. You know, even prior to this passage at um, verse 15, we can go back to verse 4 in chapter 1 of Mark. And we read that John the Baptist was in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And finally, please note, that Jesus says, repent and believe, not repent or believe. So I guess repenting is just one of those things I tell my kids about. You don't have to like it, you just have to do it. But just what does it mean to repent? Maybe we should start by looking at some things that repent does not mean. Repentance does not mean that you are without sin. Can I have a show of hands of anyone who was uh, without sin? That's good because if the only person um, who was without sin in history is sitting out there, it puts a lot more pressure on me. So. Repentance does not mean to get my life together before seeking forgiveness. It does not mean that you will never sin again. It doesn't mean that we love our neighbors any less or any differently after we repent. And it doesn't change that definition of neighbor, which is everyone, period. And I'm sorry, folks, but repentance does not mean asking God for forgiveness with the intent to go right on sinning. Okay, so what the heck does repent mean? What does Jesus mean when he tells us we must repent? 
Well, in trying to figure this out, I was going to hit you with some of my superior knowledge of Greek and Hebrew um, and all that um, seminary jazz that I don't really know anything about. But maybe it's better to just let Scripture define Scripture. At Ezekiel 18, verse 30, the prophet Ezekiel tells the Israelites to repent. And then he tells us a little bit about what that looks like. He says, repent, turn away from all your offenses. Then sin will not be your downfall. So perhaps we should be looking at repentance as a turning away. And from what are we turning? Sin. Our sins. Right. This means that we must turn our back on our sins and move away from them. And as a part of that moving away, repentance includes a genuine, heartfelt sense of sorrow for having committed those sins. God's not looking for us just to say, all right, that's it, I'm done with that, what's next? Because remember, our sins, whatever they are, are a direct disobedience of our loving Father. And it's a falling short of what he desires for us. So a sense of sorrow for disappointing a parent is not necessarily an abnormal reaction for us. Perhaps we have all disobeyed our parents. I'd be willing to bet money on that. And we have felt real remorse afterward. Sometimes even when we don't get caught. And as I said a minute ago, turning our back on our sin does not mean that we will never sin again. We are fallen people with sin natures. We will stumble and fall. The important thing is that we have a real heartfelt desire to do better. It's easy for us to say, man, I'm really sorry that I committed that sin. And we can really mean that when we say it. The problem occurs when we add, you know, I bet I'm going to feel even sorrier tomorrow when I do it again. It's kind of a fine hair to split, isn't it? In one breath, I'm telling you that you will sin again, even if you do repent. But then in the next breath, I'm telling you that you shouldn't anticipate sinning the next time that you do. So maybe what we're looking at here um, includes intentions. Repentance carries with it the knowledge that we will almost certainly sin again, but it also requires a commitment to try to do better. To put it in the simplest terms that I can think of, we know we're going to sin again, but it doesn't mean that we ought to be out looking for opportunities. Well, having decided that we are turning away from something, obviously, by definition, that means that we must be turning toward something else. And that's what the question is. What are we turning toward? And the Apostle Peter helps us with this um, in Acts 3.19 when he tells us, um, repent then and turn to God so that your sins might be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So we're turning to God. But please know that we are not turning to a God that hurls thunderbolts at a world full of sin. If he did that, we would all be in trouble. And I'm not sure that I would want to be sitting as close as Carol is to Bill Rittenauer right now. No, we are turning to a God of love. A God who loves us so much that he will do anything to have a relationship with us. And that includes you and you. You, you, Bill, and even me. Our God will never, ever, ever Stop pursuing us. He will follow us through our deepest, most secret, and ugliest sins with one goal in mind, and that's to save us. 
so that we can be with him. We're talking about a God who loves us so much that the very good news that his only begotten son tells us we must believe in Mark 1.15 includes that son's death on a Roman cross in order that our sins are forgiven. So maybe the real question we should be asking ourselves is why is it so often um, difficult to make that choice to turn from the sin that is hurting us and maybe even those that we love and turn toward the love of our Heavenly Father. Well, the last question I want to talk about with you this morning is this. Does our salvation require us to repent? That sounds like an easy question. The fact is that mine's much, much, much greater than mine has struggled with this question. And I used a lot of muches because it does not take much to have a greater mind than me. But I would like to humbly give you my two cents worth. And the beauty of the question of repentance and salvation, whether salvation requires us to repent, is that it allows me to go back to my days as a lawyer and use some of my best legal talk. Because the answer is, well, it depends. <laughs> or maybe, well, yes and no. Jesus absolutely does tell us to repent and believe. But the hitch in our giddy-up, didn't think you were going to hear that in church this morning, did you? <laughs> Comes when we start thinking that repentance somehow earns us our salvation. This is because we know that there is absolutely nothing that we can do that will earn us salvation. Why is that? Because salvation is a free gift from our loving Father, and we're justified by faith alone. Saying that we cannot be saved until and unless we do some act, any act, flies in the face of that fact. But, you know, if we look at repentance as a component of faith, rather than a separate act, maybe things make a little more sense. Earlier we defined, as, uh, defined repentance as a turning away from from our sins, and a turning toward God. I um, contend to you that perhaps this turning is actually the result of what happens when we fully understand just what the good news we are required to believe is. In order to understand, we must change our attitude about sin and God. If we do not turn from sin, can we really say we understand and have faith in God's very nature? If we say we truly believe the good news, but continue to revel in our sins, do we really understand the nature of that good news? Can we really say that we believe that God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son to die? so that our sins may be forgiven while we continue to willfully commit that sin with no remorse? Well, I hope your answer is, of course not. When we come to believe and truly understand the good news, repentance is not so much something we do. Being repentant is something that we are. We notice our sins more. We don't really like what we see. And we begin to feel that sense of remorse that maybe was lacking a little bit before. And then we resolve to do better. So don't fear the R word. Genuine repentance can give one a life-altering sense of peace, and well-being. 
and it can allow us to leave our sins where God intends them to be, as far from us as the east is from the west. And not only that, repentance can lead to a, some other R words, like redemption and resurrection. And that, my friends, is reason for rejoicing. Let's pray. Father God, Jesus tells us that your kingdom is near. We need do no more than repent and believe the good news, and we can reach out for that kingdom, knowing that someday we will be with you there. Thank you for loving us so much that you will follow us ceaselessly and never give up on us, no matter what we've done. I pray that all those in this room and everywhere will come to know that love. In Christ's name, amen. Well, why don't we stand up and sing about that last R word, rejoice. May be seated. At this um, time in our service, we would like to acknowledge those people who are wor worshiping with us on um, live stream. It is our pleasure to have you worshiping with us, and we do hope that you will have a good week and a very, very happy new year. Um, if you can't be with us in person next week, Please join us again on live stream. Thank you for joining us. We are always pleased to share our joys and concerns with our friends. If you have a joy or concern this morning that you would like to share, Please raise your hand and an usher will bring you a microphone and please state your name 